Uh, the main question is, is this available to us, the recording? And the answer is yes. Go to leanleadership.guru. There's a blue button there, and it says join our online office. You can get a seven-day trial free, so just apply for it. You'll get a, an email back uh, telling you how to join. Now, when you go in, along the top, there is a documents icon. You'll find the documents icon. Click on that. Then you'll find webinars. Then you'll find Jeff Liker webinars, and it's in there. Uh, Jeff, thank you very much for doing this again um, each month. You're so consistent. Thank you. Go ahead. The second approach is hot jobs approach, fixing the company. Uh, that also is usually a tools-based approach. And in some ways, and it, well, it certainly supports the company-wide tools approach. So typically what we're doing with the hot jobs approach is we are sending in the experts and they're fixing something. And if they're fixing productivity, we're going to ask, what are the tools we need to fix productivity? It might be set up cells every place and develop standard, standard work. It may be uh, figure out how many people we should have based on benchmarks for this call center. Eliminate, if we're 20% over, eliminate 20% of the people and then provide standard methods for everybody else to make them more efficient, hand them the standard work, train them in it and then walk away. Uh, it's still usually short term and the strengths and weaknesses are similar in that uh, it, it, well, it has the advantage over the tools approach in that, in that there's a crisis and the actions you're taking are directed toward a purpose which is to solve the crisis. That's not true in the lean tools approach. The lean tools approach Somebody decided we want to be lean, we want to look lean, so let's make ourselves look lean. And there's no clear tie to a business problem. In this case, there's not only a tie to a business problem, but there's a burning platform. It tends to be one-dimensional, focused on that one business problem. Uh, you have very clear targets for improvement, and usually it's meet the targets or potentially lose your job. Uh, the process improvements tend to be isolated in order to most, expe most expediently fix the problem. For example, uh, I remember a company that was on the lean tools journey and they were not getting very great results and then the company got in trouble. They happened to be an auto supplier and then they brought in uh, the gold rat method and they created Jonas and one of my former students was a Jonah and he said, this is great. With Lean, we were doing a lot of things, but it took a long time to see any results. With Theory of Constraints, we find the constraint, we make sure we don't starve the constraints, we put in extra inventory, and suddenly everything works better in the plant. Flow is restored, and we're meeting customer demand. So a few changes, it takes a few weeks, and the whole plant's transformed. Some companies will use Kaizen events for this purpose. Uh, because the Kaizen event is quick, a week, and we can make a lot of changes fast, and by the end of the week you see the results. This generates high interest and support, and if it's done with the people, like good Kaizen events instead of to the people, then you can very, very heavily engage people, get them excited, even create what some would call a life-changing experience for that week, for the week that they're participating you can get the resources available because it's a crisis or because we have the one week and we know we start Monday and then Friday. Uh, you might have maintenance people on call ready to move things. Uh, there's a bias for action. You actually make radical changes that you wouldn't make in a slower deployment of tools. There's an opportunity to convince the skeptics. They don't believe there's anything to this Lean Six Sigma stuff and suddenly they see operations changing and uh, 10 people goes to 5 people in a week and they say, wow, there's something to this. Uh, we really could change this company if we keep doing this. And you're solving top management problems and therefore you get their support. The traps are that this is rarely driven by a vision for the company. We're not striving towards some 
clear vision of what we need to look like to be excellent, to be great. We're fixing problems. We're getting through the crisis. And usually when you get through the crisis, once you're through it, then people tend to relax. There's some residual uh, frenetic energy for maybe six months to a year, and then people start to relax, and you start going backward to where you were. Uh, there's very little ownership. There's very little residual skill development. And the uh, senior management then have learned a lesson because they're watching this. And their lesson is we uh, have a crisis, we have a focus, we measure, we hold people accountable. They make quick, frenetic changes, and we see results. So it's a very clear cause and effect. I've got a problem. We put a lot of people on it. We blitz the problem. We see the results. We move to the next problem. And that becomes their image of what lean is, what process improvement is. It's very mechanistic, and it's not going to lead to continuous improvement. It's not going to lead to cultural change. It's really a culture of firefighting. It's a culture of coercion. It's a culture of get the numbers or else. Uh, and uh, it's, it's certainly very, very far away from the Toyota Way vision. Third approach, developing lean coaches. And this is an approach which now I would say is a bridge, but it's now starting to move into the deeper deployment instead of the narrow deployment. I say it's a bridge because in the narrow deployment, you might create a department of uh, change agents industrial engineers, process excellence, uh, coaches or experts, uh, black belts, but you're creating specialists who go in and solve the hot problems or go out and deploy the tools. So it can be used, again, for the narrow, broad approach. But for the deep approach, the role of the coaches is to coach managers of processes to transform further skills so that they can become continuous improvement experts, so they can could every day improve their processes. So this can be used in either direction. The uh, challenge of creating a lean coach is that there's two types of knowledge. One is explicit procedural knowledge, which is relatively easy to teach. And the other is tacit knowledge or know-how, which is very difficult to teach. And I say the explicit knowledge is easy to teach, but in reality, it takes more work than we usually think it takes. So, for example, lean tools and companies that have gone beyond lean tools and moved into cultural change will often say the lean tools are easy. That's the easy part. We can teach somebody how to set up a Kanban system. We can teach somebody how to write a standard worksheet. The hard part is the cultural change, dealing with people. Uh, the reality is that there are many, many types of Kanban systems, and the Kanban systems really should be continually adjusted as your demand changes, as new parts are introduced, as product is redesigned. Uh, and the process of using Kanban is really a process of continuous improvement. That is, you need the judgment to know it's time to pull out a Kanban, reduce the inventory, and so that problems will surface more quickly. So we will drive continuous improvement. And I guess that's the tacit know-how that goes along with the calculations of how many Kanban we need and the actual making up of the cards. Uh, so there's sort of a physical part that seems somewhat straightforward, although most people have some difficulty in calculating a uh, number of Kanban. Uh, it's not so straightforward. You have to take into account variation. Uh, but if you can get past that, there still is some tacit knowledge and know-how related to implementing the tool in a way 
that it becomes useful and dynamic and changes as conditions change. The problem solving methodology is also explicit knowledge again, a lot to learn if you are going through all the steps and you're doing them well. Root cause analysis is not trivial at all and you could spend um, much of your life getting better and better at root cause analysis. So I wouldn't denigrate these tools by saying anybody can learn them. Anybody can learn to use them badly just like anybody could learn to swing a golf club badly. But the tool of using, using the tool of the golf club and consistently hitting the ball well and cleanly is not trivial for anybody who's tried to do it and requires a lot of body parts moving in the right way at the right time. Facilitation skills are even more complicated because that involves human dynamics. There is then a whole another set of change agent skills that are very, very tacit, like I said, applying the tools to novel situations, adjusting the tools, getting them used, knowing when to push people and be a bit coercive and when to step back, give them opportunities to fail, uh, knowing how fast to push. Those are all judgments that you learn through experience. Understanding political situations and Every change involves politics, that is people win and people lose, and people who are winning think they're losing, and you're managing perceptions. And then coaching others means you have to learn how to teach, you have to learn how to read people, read their skill level, read their body language, uh, and building engagement and involvement is uh, very much uh, an art form, and lots of uh, socio-emotional emotional skills involved. So. There is a lot to learn to be a good lean coach. The, the uh, technical parts of the tools, the art of the tools, and then how to manage change. Now how do we develop skills? And now I'm shifting to uh, some of the earlier presentations I've done about Toyota Kata, uh, the method Mike Rothers spearheaded. And Really, Toyota Kata is not something mysterious that was learned from Toyota and only applies to Toyota. It's looking at how we learn any complex skill. It's very fundamental. How do you learn to play golf? How do you learn to play the violin? How do you learn to cook? How do you learn to make pottery? How do you learn to be a good welder? How do you learn to program software? For any complex skill, what we know is that the only way to learn the skill, to develop the skill, is through practice. Unfortunately, our memories are very faulty and weak the first time we learn something. It penetrates short-term memory, sits in long-term memory perhaps for a short period of time, for a few days, and if you don't reuse it, it starts to decay almost immediately. When we have long time gaps between practice sessions, the effectiveness of, of the practice goes down. And if we have a long time gap, gap between learning something in a lesson, like we take a golf lesson, and then we don't touch the club again for another two weeks, most of what we learned in that lesson is lost. And it seems that the right frequency for practicing any skill is once a day. And in fact, when you practice, Guitar, I know that they recommend 20 minutes, you take a break, 20 minutes, you take a break, and you might spread that throughout the day, totaling, if you're serious and you want to be a, a professional, about four hours a day. Uh, we're unfortunately particularly bad at self-feedback. We think we're doing it, but we're not. And... I just went through this because I started for the, about the fourth time taking golf lessons, been playing about 15 years. I took a lesson three weeks ago, I took another, I practiced every day, I took another lesson, he corrected all the bad habits I learned while I practiced on my own. Uh, I then practiced for 10 days while we were traveling. I was hitting the ball well and I thought I'm really doing it, I'm really swinging the way he taught me. He videotaped me. It looked just like it looked before my first lesson. 
So he had to start over with the basics. Uh, so I completely misread what I was doing. And it was not until I actually saw myself on the videotape and he pointed things out to me that I realized I had not, I wasn't learning. I had reverted back to my bad, comfortable golf swing. So we're not very good at seeing ourselves and we need somebody to look over our shoulder and to coach us. And that's unfortunate because it costs time, it costs money, uh, and we often don't want or believe we have the time or money to get the coach to have the lesson and then to practice. Hypnotize something in the air.